Hello. So this is a test for anyone watching to see if you can hear us. There's lots of background noise, but let us know if you hear nothing at least. That's the live stream. The source of the stream. Is the camera there?
languages or games, collaborate with one another on projects. One thing that I want to mention is, is that there was a discussion on the mailing list a little while ago about building data science libraries um, in Racket. And so I put something on the wiki uh, collecting all of the, those discussions. I think that if people are interested in that, uh, that would be a good thing to do. My plan generally is um, to either use space in this room for people getting help, or maybe if people want to collaborate, there's so many little rooms on this floor. So it's basically a, a free form hacking day. Um, we are going to have lunch delivered later. Um, and then we have the space until the evening. Um, any questions or comments about that? Yeah? Will there be more coffee coming? <laughs> Is there going to be a break uh, delivered? Uh, yeah. The, the place that we normally get the coffee from during the week is uh, closed on Sundays. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, one, there's a vending machine in the basement with uh, high caffeine frappuccinos. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I'm adding to the schedule. I'm going to do a breakout session. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, no, for uh, for pollen. Anybody who's interested in pollen or has pollen projects, or anybody interested in quad, the uh, type PDF type setting system, I'll be doing that in the afternoon. So if you're interested in learning how to get started with it, or if you've got projects and you want help with it, uh, it's all yeah, cool. All right, awesome. Uh, so let's get started um, with a presentation from Matthew on the state of racket. Well, the short answer is that Racket is in very good shape. <laughs> you know, Implementation-wise, and we'll talk about this a little, a little more, we've taken a step back to take a step forward so that we can take a lot more steps forward uh, with a lot of effort on the Racket on the Shea um, free implementation. Meanwhile, community involvement is, uh, is, it feels up to me. You know, it's hard to put a number to this, but more people are getting involved, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And there's a newsletter uh, that's a big part of that. Um, and I would also say that um, more and more people have heard about Racket and language-oriented programming, um, and, and that Racket is cool because of that. So some of our advertising is paying off, and I'm seeing a lot more buzz around Racket as a result. Uh, so that's very positive. Uh, maybe I should keep a running count now going forward. I, last year we had just crossed a thousand packages, now we're up to 1231. So I, that's a, another indicator, some number that you can put on my community involvement. Um, you know, not a huge number in absolute terms, but a pretty big number um, for for package system that's been around for a few years now. Going back to community involvement, I think this is a great thing. Uh, thanks to Paul Mountains for, for for taking this on and. Uh, Keeping it going for several issues already with the plans. Uh, Paulo has also taken over the Racket Twitter feed. So uh, he's, okay. yeah, that'll, that'll keep him up to date on what he should include in the news. <laughs> I know he, he appreciates contributions, so get in touch with him if you have something you want in the news. Go Paulo! Yeah, go Paulo. Uh, Racket Fest. So Jesse Alama has been running Racket Fest. There was one already. Uh, in the winter, there will be a summer edition in about a month. I think Jay mentioned that yesterday. So if you're in the Berlin area in uh, August, that's the place to be. And just a note on sort of the efforts to, to get the word out, this article I think was pretty successful uh, in the communications of the ACM to just sort of lay out what Racket is and what we mean for our language oriented program. So that's some of the things uh, we list that, that was really interesting. So that was sort of last year, but it sort of uh, picked up steam, I would say, uh, over this year going forward. So that's the state of Racket globally. Uh, of course, since I'm up here, what I actually talk about most of the time is the state of the, uh, the Racket runtime system, uh, the core implementation. And I think everybody knows uh, about Racket on Shea. You may have seen a curve like this. This is the Gartner hype curve. Um, uh, that works really well for explaining the, what happens to a lot of things. So, uh, this applies equally well for me for, for Racket on Shea. So I put the date something like this. Uh, technology trigger, Shea scheme becomes open source. Within six months, we say, yeah, we're going to move to that. Uh, the timing was working out for us. And it's going to solve all of our problems, clearly. Uh, and then after a year of <coughs> making it work, um, it will solve some of our problems sometimes. Okay. But there was a long ways to go. Fortunately, over the next year or so, it started to... Uh, actually fall into place and I thought it would take about two years and you can always you know 
redefined things so that it took two years. <laughs> um, and now at two and a half years, we're well onto that plateau where it's starting, it's something that you can actually run. There are still some bugs, like I can't run my mail client on it every day because then I have to reboot it every three or four days or something wrong with networking, but it's at that level. Um, so we have, you know, tests are passing. The core test suite passes completely as of a week or two ago. Uh, Dr. Doctor, which is running all the tests of all the main distribution stuff, uh, there's just 50 failures now. There was several hundred when we just first turned it on. We haven't turned it on for packages yet, but we'll do that soon. And I expect it'll look pretty similar to this one. Okay. Almost everything's gonna work. There will be a, a few gaps to fill in still. Okay. So we're getting close. Uh, just a couple of more guys. This is one that you've seen, although I've stretched the scale out for reasons that you'll see in a moment. But at the top is how long it takes to build the distribution using regular Racket. And at the bottom is building the distribution using Racket CS. And this was worrying me at least and I think other people. Um, this is one of those cases where we found the one stupid thing that was holding it back and cut off 30 to 45 minutes. So this is where we are now. And this starts to look much more possible, right? And this is a from scratch build. Uh, single processor. So I, when I build on my machine with multiple processors, it, it takes more like 25 minutes to build a regular racket and 30 to 35 minutes uh, to build racket CS from scratch. So again, we're getting into that plausible uh, productivity. Another thing that we've learned is that this is on the same scale. This is the time taken to just compile. So, you know, one of the switches from traditional racket to racket CS is going from a bytecode compiler that didn't really do all that much, it does some high-level optimizations, to a compiler to native code that does register allocation and things like that. So new compile time is more expensive, and we thought maybe that was responsible for the big difference, but no, this is really the part that's compile time for that build, 16 minutes versus four minutes, factor two to four or something we expect, but compile time is only a piece of things, and so, um, well, compile times will remain longer, it's not really going to be the big obstacle that we're talking about before. Question? What do the orange regions represent on this? Uh, the orange is just uh, compiling. Oh, so it's compiling. Thank you. Um, what I've done is to um, you can you can build the distribution in a mode where all the bytecode is really just macro expanded, just down to the core linklet forms. And so this is compiling those core linklet forms into the final ZOs, the, the racket ZOs or the racket CSEs. And so it's all compile time, no rendering time. Limit. Sorry, I, I've, seen, uh, I've seen some white regions and some orange regions. Okay, so the white is while we're in some particular collection. Like this is the first typed, I see. The first typed collection, so it's doing type tracking. Yep. So is this, okay, to clarify, so this is the time it takes to compile to uh, change to scheme, or is this the time it takes to compile like chase scheme? This is the time it takes to compile all the racket modules in the main distribution from fully expanded form to either bytecode or machine code. Okay. So compiling roughly a million lines of source racket code to machine code is 16 minutes, which starts to sound like a respectable compile time. Um, back in January, when we first said, okay, things are starting to run, you should try it out. Uh, Alex uh, Harsanyi uh, posted some benchmark results, just taking his test week as a benchmark <coughs> to see how well Racket CS performs. And so the middle blue bars are there in January, and then the lower bar, bar he was kind enough to, uh, to rerun those for me uh, to see where we are now. So you see we're getting a lot closer. Uh, the red is traditional Racket. Um, and the increase here, there's actually the same increase in the red bar, just running January versus now, 7.1 versus 7.3. So that's not actually a regression there. It's just things are slower for whatever reason, whatever changed in the world six months later. Uh, the important thing is this, the second part, you're getting closer to the red bars. Not all the way there. And this was not a case of the one stupid thing that we just fixed. Uh, this was dozens or I don't know, lots of little things. You fix this micro benchmark, you fix this micro benchmark, you fix this other uh, thing over here, you redo the IO system. And eventually things are starting to fall. <laughs> so uh, I think this will, will keep going, you know, inching down very gradually. Um, but I think we're in a place where it's not what I do all day every week. Uh, right? It's, it's going to take a while for it to even out, but it'll probably even out in the blue bar. We'll probably, 
this is what we expect, drop a little below where the, the radio bar used to be. Any questions on this? Um, and ICFP this year in August, just after RacketFest. Um, ICFP has decided to co-locate with RacketFest, I think. Um, <laughs> there is a paper about racket on chase scheme, so you've heard most of the material before. But the paper goes into much more detail about how we manage the semantic mismatch between chase scheme and racket. And you can see the, the rainbow of uh, solutions here. Uh, so blue just means we take care of it in our, in our racket to scheme compiler. Uh, called Schemify. The red things are where we had to change chase schemes. Um, and the purple things are where we had to change chase scheme, but it's clearly beneficial to the chase scheme community too, so it's already been merged. Uh, and then the, these orange things that are really in the corners, but if we're going to change chase scheme anyway, it's easy to make some small adjustments to make eek work on flow downs and so on. So we've done that. That was ICFP 18. That'll be ICFP 19, about a week, a uh, month from now. So the paper is now, you can find it from my webpage if you want to. Uh, thinking back to Aaron Turin's remarks yesterday, how has it gone just community to community? You show up to, and say, hey, I'm from Racket, I'm here to help the Chase Key community. <laughs> <laughs> how are they feeling? Because you've said, you know, you've been submitting patches and this yeah. and that. Yeah, well, I just flooded them with patches in a sense. I said, here's all the things we would like to do, and then you can see which ones you're interested in. So in that process, I've got a sense for what kinds of things they are, they are interested in can accommodate. Meanwhile, we're close enough that I can keep syncing with the main uh, Shea scheme, Shea scheme branch. So we keep getting their updates. So you're never going to have to fork it in other words to have your own. Yeah, uh, yeah. well, yeah, it depends on how you define fork. Either we have forked, but we're not forever okay. uh, necessarily or something. We don't know. We'll see how it goes. So far, so good. Um, and the worst case scenario still looks like a good scenario for us. Is there another comment up here? I was going to ask the same thing. Whether okay. That was in the okay. So I'm not going to go through these details. Uh, you've heard some of them, and I'll leave it to the paper for the others. I'll tell you about one more thing that uh, was more of interest to you, perhaps, than the broad IC, broader ICFP community, which is going back to this issue of compilation and bytecode. So the way things work right now in traditional racket, you have racket sources, and then you run racko setup or racko package install, which does racket setup, and you get zeo files, and I put zeo in red there because that's bytecode that is platform independent but specific to a traditional racket, specific to that particular runtime system. And then when you load that, if you're on my laptop, then uh, in the process of loading and eventually running the JIT turns that into machine code. So it makes sense to uh, packages to racket code as source packages. And we have a notion of built packages where those sources are compiled into zero form so that you can quickly install things. And then uh, even if you don't do that directly, uh, when you get a minimal racket distribution, say a release distribution, it's pointing to build packages so that it can install those packages. If we look at the racket uh, on chase scheme world, then you have racket sources. When you do racket setup, you get byte code, byte code in quotes, right? It's a zero file that's actually machine code. So it's not only specific to racket on chase scheme, it's specific to the particular processor um, or an operating system and other things like that. So in that case, we still, it's the same packages. The, the, the leftmost box is the same, but it doesn't really work to call that built packages because we would have to build for all different platforms uh, and all the different varieties, and we don't want to do that. Um, so what we have instead is a new mode, and dash M is kind of the flag at the racket executable layer, so I'll just use it as a, as a shorthand. <coughs> a way of running racket in a mode that generates these bytecode files, again, bytecode in quotes, um, that are really just the macro expanded in core linklet form um, as expressions, but fast. I think I have a this as an Okay, yes. So um, that is what I was using when I did those graphs that showed just the compile time. Okay. And so you might think that, uh, uh, well, it's sort of, it, I was solving this problem and then discovered that I could do those measurements. So that's, that's how we got there. Right, so once again, uh, it does make sense to have packages as the racket source and build packages that, is, that are these kinds of zeos. And then you saw that scale of how long it takes to compile. It's still pretty fast to install this notion of build package compared to building from source. So in fact, with 7.4, that's what the build packages are going to be. They're actually just these uh, fully expanded things. And when you install it on a particular installation, on a particular machine, running a particular VM, Maybe you get red ZOs, 
Or maybe you get blue zeros that are missing. Question. So um, is there a plan to make, I guess, these dot zero files since it's just going it's going to be doing a bit less, it sounds like mostly just a, a, a kind of binary S expression format? Is it uh, going to be kind of a stabilized thing so you could have like Somebody could go and implement racket on D or something just using these? That is a good question. So the question is, um, you know, will we specify the content of this, this kind of zeal in a way that we haven't specified in the past? In the past, it was a, a format that changes even every time we added a new primitive uh, to the runtime system. So conceivably, yes, there's no particular plan right now, uh, but I think that is a potential direction. Uh, also, it does help with uh, with um, deterministic compilation. Right? So it's much easier to make these things deterministic than try to make sure Shay's scheme is deterministic or even certain aspects of, of the red format over there. Are these things uh, really called zeos that it's name or they sort of a weird directory? No, so they really are still the file name the zeo. And so Racco setup looks at the zeo and the associated depth and says, oh, I'm supposed to be compiling for this machine. Currently it's in platform independent mode, I'll just do the task about it. And then it overwrites the zero. All right. So hold on. So that means that like if I want to have both versions installed at the same time, ah, then it okay. might be then the, the red mode will replace the zero <coughs> and the blue mode won't have that so I'll have to start from scratch. That is correct. So you can you can set up racket and racket CS so they're sitting on top of each other and racket CS writes to a subdirectory of compiled. That does not play as nicely with this because you'll run one of the RACO setups or the other first, and the machine independent will be converted, and then the other one will have to go from the source again. Mm -hmm. So it's just happening it, on my machine. Right? I, think that's, I think I now understand why that's happening on my machine. Well, but this is probably so when you just run make and then RACO get checkout, this doesn't happen at all. This is only like the nightly builds use this or the, the distribution calls. So it's probably not what you're seeing. Maybe I just misunderstood. You, you suggested using a subdirectory of compiled. Isn't that a solution where you have maybe a subdirectory of compiled for J and for Uh, True. Yes. I've advocated this to Matthew several times in the past. And it gets yeah. <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> complicated. The thing is, search paths, and search paths are terrible, and parameterizing search paths creates all sorts of issues for tools. Yeah. I will say slightly more about that later, but only to say it's still hard. Uh, while we're on this topic, just one more little thing that you may wonder about. How does Racket get built in the first place? Well, traditional Racket seems kind of easy. There's a bunch of C code. You must have a C compiler. Then you can get Racket. Actually, you can do that to get Racket CGC, the one that uses conservative garbage collection to cooperate with C. And then what happens if you type Racket on make from, from scratch? is that it transforms the C code to some similar looking C code, but C code that cooperates with the garbage collector. So a C to C compiler, that compiler is called XFARM. Um, yeah, it's a big hack. Um, but to run XFARM, XFARM is obviously written in Racket. So the process is you build Racket CGC, you run XFARM to transform the C files, then you can build regular Racket, sometimes known as Racket 3 m Meanwhile, over in Racket on Chase Team world, uh, there's some C code, but I'll gloss over that. There's a bunch of racket code right, that gets converted by the schemify, racket to scheme compiler, into chasescheme.ss files, which gets converted, um, gets compiled using chasescheme's compile function to, to build racket CS. So, how does schemify run? Well, that's obvious. Uh, we build racket, uh, which we can do in a couple of steps to get to schemify. How does compile run? Oh, well, you need chasescheme to do that. Okay, so you run Chase Scheme to run the compiler to generate Racket CS. Where did Chase Scheme come from? <laughs> uh, well, it's written in Chase Scheme. So there are some Chase Scheme source files. Again, there's some C, but that's easy part, so we call server it. Uh, those need to be compiled to, to generate Chase Scheme. Uh, okay, how do you compile the Chase Scheme source to generate Chase Scheme? In the Chase Scheme world, the answer is well, obviously, you have Chase Scheme. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the compiled files get checked into the, the repo. Uh, we don't do that. We've stripped out those compiled boot files and our source distributions. And instead, we use Racket with the uh, <laughs> to load the JSTEAM compiler well enough, it's a little bit tricky, well enough so that it can compile itself and then we're up to the races. Okay, so you can see there's no cycles in this graph. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, the root is dot c. So we need a seek compiler, and that's about it. Is, is Shay actually at all interesting? I mean, this has the nice advantage that you can compile Shay scheme now just from source without an existing compiler. Yeah. Are they interested? As in when I put my Shay scheme hacker hat on and modify Shay scheme, this is convenient for me. Because it's not always easy to apply the old Shay scheme to get the new Shay scheme. Right. It's somewhat easier to do this. Yeah. Uh, this this thing does have to know about some implementation details. Two load things in the right order to know about the right structure sheet. It's much easier to, to modify that and that than to get the bootstrapping. Yeah. So they might be interested, but I, I don't know. In the post C racket world, how hard is it going to be to bring this to a new platform? Uh, to a new platform. Well, so right, in, so here. If you're going to complete a new platform, we need a Shay scheme backend for that platform. And I know there are people interested in ARM64, for example, who will be looking at that. Um, I'm not sure I can say anything more than that because right now we'll still rely on this same. In the future, I mean, part of the, the motivation for Racket on Shay was to be able to get rid of this stuff. Right? So now we would be removing uh, that stuff. But I think there is a simpler thing here that is maybe C based, but maybe C generated for Racket code. Where you check in the generated C files, so um, and that the C file is readable and modifiable, so that you could modify it if you needed to change, uh, if you needed to escape a bootstrapping loop. More so a, more of a squeak style bootstrap. Uh, somewhat, somewhat like that. Yeah, I really want to avoid the image, even chase schemes. So that's a little bit of the image thing. Like if you try to look for base RTD's definition, there is no definition of base RTD. It comes from the image that you use to compile the next one. Um, so, yes and no. I just wanted to say thank you for doing this because I was really afraid last year when we described the, the thing because we've been working hard in the Geeks community to be able to provide full bootstrapping, even uh -huh. bootstrapping C. And this means that it looks like we should be able to bootstrap bracket, you know, without having to be afraid of a Thompson attack. Exactly. There was some concern about building an open source project from boot files that had been generated from previously closed source and not having that. Uh, that uh, open source, um, what's the right word, provenance uh, for the files. So that was also part of the motivation. That was the motivation, except I needed it more immediately just to be able to distribute the source. So that's <laughs> All right, so uh, that's about it. I think you have an idea of the transition now. 7.4 coming out this month will give you Racket CS as a, John's locking your foot, uh, but will give you Racket CS as a download option. Right? But it won't be the default. Right? Uh, and then sometime along the way, we will make, uh, we'll just rename Racket CS to Racket. And I guess the old will still be available through its old original uh, transition name, Racket 3 yeah. You've talked a lot about benchmarks and the time it takes to build and yeah. how things perform. How are you performing? I know this is a subjective question, but now that you've got a system that, that you reach right. that, that productivity plateau. What is your sense of how well it is to work on the internal? Yeah, system? yeah. It is no question it's much better to work on the new system. So uh, are you 4X? Are you 10X? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is your background uh, <laughs> you know, I became such a practice C programmer. I think I'm 2X. But I think what's more important is that it's 10X for other people who didn't create the big pile of bad C code. <laughs> and that was the point. It's better for me, but it's way better for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. I have, in fact, already fixed a bug in the Racket on Shade code during Matthew's talk. So oh, there we go. <laughs> and it was a one line change. All right. I'll be curious to hear later what it was. Um, this is a little bit of speculation, but if we're going to change to Racket CS at some later 8.0, we might take the opportunity to make some further backwards, like intentionally write some tests uh, to shed some things that cause trouble that we don't really need. Like my favorite one to shed would be the implicit conversion for when you're looking for a .ss file and you find a .rkt file, just magically make it work. Uh, I said search pads are bad, this makes it worse. Um, if we have two versions of bracket running for a while, that gives people time to, to change over. Uh, Little things like this, and we can discuss the details of that in pull request and, and the mailing list. But that level of thing. If you have some ideas on there, maybe there should be a Wikipedia page of, of wishes. Uh, yeah, I think one of your other eight major areas of backwards incompatibility that you expect in version eight, and secondly, are there areas that you would want to solicit more 
felt from the community at this point in terms of <laughs> transition? Yeah, I think mostly I would be interested in, I think what's best for us now is to throw out the ideas. Because I remember some of them off the top of my head and some of them, it's going to be a year later, I thought, oh, I wish we had done that, right? But you'll think of some of those things. Um, but I, I can't, I haven't thought through this enough to say enough things what might be incompatible. It would be things like this conversion. Okay, I can say a few things. It would be like this conversion. There's a particular layer of a val handler and compile and load use compile and handler and so on. And some of those are a little awkward and don't let us give the right error message that we want. So we might just change that stack of handlers in a totally incompatible way. You probably, how many people have ever said any of those handlers? Three, four? Just screw it, okay. <laughs> yeah, so things that probably don't affect you. Maybe along the lines, we already did this single flow time change, right? We had some discussion on that, decided to go for it, and it seems to have been a good move and brought the two things in line, even though there was some incompatibility there. All right, great. Just one thing on things people can do. Matt, you mentioned we haven't run the package build yet yeah. on Racket on Shea. So uh, the, when you do that for your packages, First, uh, see, see what works, uh, see what doesn't work, fix things that don't work, uh, let us know about bugs. But also, when that happens, there will be an opportunity for people who want to help other people out to fix their thing on Bracket on Shay. Uh, there's, yeah. as Matthew said, 1,200 packages out there. Uh, not all of them are being actively maintained uh, or have people who want to put the time into doing that testing and fixing. And so helping out with that can be a big benefit for the whole community right. to interact on chat. Right. I think everyone's clear on this. There are some incompatibilities, some inherent incompatibilities that we expect to stick around. But so we need to know more about whether that's really okay. Um, and like the C API as opposed to the FFI. The FFI is all there and pretty much, but when you want to call a racket from C, we have just punted on that for now. Uh, if anyone needs that, then one day we may go do that. Go run that part. It's, some approximation can be done there. Right? But we would like to shed some things, so this seems like something we can shed. All right, any more on the current state? More questions, okay. Where to go from here? So this is the part where we try speculating about the future, and you know, I make some guesses based on what I think I will do, what I know other people are thinking about and working on, what? seems to need to be done, and I often blame that uncertainty on the magic eight ball. Uh, but I'm not gonna go that way this year. Right? Um, instead of trying to predict the future, let's, um, I'm going to suggest a particular path. Right? I think that this is a good point in Racket's uh, development to, to think about where we go next as a community, and I'm gonna make a, a larger proposal here. So let's, let, let, me, let me draw out some of the things that I think could be the next step. The build system, we've alluded to it a little bit and how it's kind of hard to do and we have this machine independent format and where the other files go and people always want to just be able to run record and never run record make for that to automatically work. And unfortunately it's harder than you think it is if you haven't done it. I don't know why it just is. It's one of those things like building package systems. It turns out to be tricky. Um, something about state. <laughs> file systems and supposed file systems that can't do basic file system things. Uh, so that's one direction we can go. Like, uh, as I had to modify that part, it was it was hard. But let's think a little bit bigger. Right? We can think about new backends. Part of Racket on Shape transition is we are in much better shape to build further VMs. And, and Sam's group is already doing this. So we can pick it, and we'll continue on that path. Every time I talk about Racket on Shea, someone says, oh, WebAssembly? <laughs> and yes, someone should do that. <laughs> <laughs> we could make that the, the big question. We can also continue improving performance. You know, the motivation for Shea scheme, it didn't work to say everything's just gonna go faster, but you can continue to think make things go faster. Um, we could go that direction. I worry a little bit that this is a classic list trap to say, oh, if only it ran really fast, everyone would use it. Um, um, and, uh, you know, maybe it's just the layer that I worked on and that I've just been doing performance for a couple of years now. Um, that's a possibility, but probably not really. Though. You can tell by the color. I didn't mean to center it, but might as well. Um, this is where I think we should go. 
languages. We should really take seriously the next iteration of the design of the language, right? Think bigger than, uh, than just try to, to tweak things and make what we have. Just to get this out of the way, um, people wonder, are we really gonna write Hashling Racket 2 and things like that? Well, maybe, or maybe we write, we pick some other name, like the Racket Rhombus language, uh, and we write Hashling Rhombus. So that's not what's important. I'm just gonna use Racket 2 as a shorthand for this new iteration of Racket. Okay. And it's not a new idea, we've talked about Racket 2 for a while. There's a, there's a wiki page on GitHub where people have added ideas, things that they would like to see in Racket 2. Uh, just a, it's a wish list, it's an open-ended list, but I think we all agree there's a couple of broad categories in that list. Um, consistency in terms of better function names, um, we have match, and we have syntax case, and we have syntax parse, and we have defined simple macro, and we have defined some, uh, syntax rule, and syntax rules, and so on. We have all these different kinds of forms for pattern matching and generation. We could unify those, things like that. Also, uh, another dimension is genericity, generality, um, more consistently using sequences and streams and these abstract data structures instead of the concrete implementations of lists and hash tables and so on. So we can do a lot more of that just in terms of the, the functions that are provided and, and the culture of using those functions. Uh, these kinds of things would be taking Racket as we have now, cleaning it up and making it even nicer. But I'm gonna say we should think bigger than this. So this is where we get to the point where I pitch a new suggestion okay, and try to explain why I'm pitching this new suggestion. Okay? A somewhat radical suggestion. What if we change the surface syntax? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the, the moans compared with laughing is about what I expected it. <laughs> Make some hell racket. <laughs> Let's get this out of the way, I like parentheses. <laughs> I would be perfectly happy to stick with the kind of surface syntax that we have now, I personally. Okay, done. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in the social context and the programming context that we live in, I gotta tell you, I've been doing this a while and the parentheses are an obstacle. Yeah. We've seen it over and over again and tried to say, here's how to design programs, here's beginning student language. No, it's not scheme. No, it's not racket. It's this language, beginning student language. Oh, it has parentheses because we know it has good properties for teaching, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, you know, they stop listening as soon as they see the parentheses. Right? And this is a real problem. And I've seen students in my class genuinely struggle with just the syntax, not the concepts. Right? And part of the problem is people have trained them from uh, algebra, you know, elementary school, to put the plus in the middle. Um, and that parentheses are for grouping things and so on. Right? So if we want to bring the goodness of Racket to a larger part of the world, we should take this, this idea seriously. And now is the time that we can, as a community, think about what that might mean and see how we might go in that direction. We can try it out. We're not deciding today. I'm not standing here and saying this is the direction we're going to go. I want to get this idea out there, start a conversation about what we might do, and start a conversation about how we might organize ourselves. Right? The Racket idea that the idea of language-oriented programming, the kinds of technologies that we have, at some layer, syntax objects and parentheses, and the way we write them down, is a valuable thing. But the idea is bigger than that. Right? The application is bigger than that. And uh, we should explore this direction. So if you start saying we're going to change the syntax, then well, and your response. You know, there, there's all sorts of possibilities. Uh, we will need to decide what are what kind of what are some of the principles or, or the, the motivating vision for this, right? And for me, I've boiled it down to three things, right? Three things that I think the syntax should do to achieve this goal of getting more people a smoother path into it, okay? And I in thick syntax, right? The plus goes in the middle. So when you say getting more people into racket, are you yeah. talking about at the BSL level? Or no, no, no. The whole damn thing? All, all levels. PSL, yes, but practicing programmers, et cetera. Yep. Excuse my ignorance on how hard this may or may not be, but would it be possible to have both surface syntax? Okay, that's a good question, and, a, and a one that people frequently ask. Uh, the question is, do I mean that there is this other syntax to complement the, the very nice one that we already have? That's not actually what I mean. I think it's important that we as a community have a canonical notation 
And then if we really want to get people into canonical rackets, you know, or the racket way of doing things, then we would have to find a syntax that we, we like as well. Right, so it's a great question, but I do in fact mean changing all the documentation notes, right? And not trying to do some sort of, um, I forgot the right word, but where there's an AST, but you can see it presented in different ways. Well, how hash line has expression? Yeah, it's obviously, obviously we can't keep you from writing S expressions. <laughs> just like we can't keep you from not writing S expressions now, we just want to sort of take advantage of that technology and build even better technology. We've been waiting a while else. If you have infix operators like minus, what happens to all the dashes in our function name? Yep, that is, that is indeed a question to ask, but not today. That's a question for, <laughs> that's a question for the community and some sort of working group at some point to figure out. Yes. So, um, can you on the live feed hear the questions or do I need to repeat them? Well, somebody on the live stream I'm, will tell I'm us. I'm sure that the answer is you need to repeat them. Okay. Uh, uh, so the, the question was about uh, what to do with hyphens and minuses and operator. Hyphens and names and minuses and operator. Yes, someone will have to figure that out. So I'm aware that parenthetical syntax is a barrier for, for and, and it is, you know, I've tried to get my employer to use it previously and stuff like that. Um, and usually I think the it's a barrier to especially people who have been exposed to other things. It's less of a barrier to people who have come out of the clean slate, right? But the, uh, um, but the, I think I'm mean, part of the appeal of bracket to me, and I also think about what this workshop delivered this week uh, for those of us who are here for bracket school. Um, one of the reasons that lists have historically been appealing to me is that finally I could see how the program worked, right? And I especially think I don't think I would have been able to do this workshop this week without that kind of clarity of how the structure worked. And so I, you've already heard a bit of this from me, but uh, I, I really, like, if we can, I really would prefer a structure if we go down this route, which I think, you know, I understand it and it makes sense, but I think that we should explore some of the type of stuff that's been done in WISP and, and sweet expressions and look to see if they're satisfactory or if we can modify them, take the approach of a language that can start with uh, um, with something that's you know that you know it, it looks something that people are more comfortable with, but it technically transforms in this other direction. Because I think that that way we won't lose the ability to be able to understand what the flow of our programs is, or even run a workshop like we did this week. Okay, so that's not really a question I can repeat, <laughs> but I'll try to summarize very briefly to make sure we understand and so to maybe pass along. Uh, there is valuable to value to parentheses. And it's, it lets you see the structure of things in a certain way. And what you're saying is we should look for a similar result in a, in a syntax that doesn't scream parentheses at you. And we should also look at the precedence of what Sweet and Wisp have tried to do to address that problem. So is that a fair summary? Yes. If, if much briefer and, and less, I mean less. <laughs> Less stress over here. Yeah, you're going to have to repeat it to other people as you talk to them. Okay, so over here. Then. Have you considered syntactic white space? Like by syntactic white space. Well, let's, let me defer that one. Let me finish this slide, actually, and then we'll continue this discussion. So <laughs> I did have just one more thing I wanted to say, and then I'll get to you, too. Okay. Um, what I wanted to say is that we do need to pick some basic rules, like what are we aiming to do? And so I just wanted to summarize my opinion of what's important to me. And what I think it should be important. And then you can disagree with it. Um, and we can have a long discussion about it. But one of them I just said, the, the, the plus goes in the middle, right? Infix, infix uh, operators. The other one is that function calls look also like they did in uh, algebra class, which is function name, okay, really function expression, open paren, argument expression, comma argument expression, and so on. And then the last one is in parentheses, you can add them wherever you want as group. Right? And if you add more parentheses, it doesn't mean function call or something. So as many times as I've been around that, those are the essential ingredients that I think are driven by the goal of uh, making an easier unwrap syntactically. This leaves a lot of space open. It does not address the question of white space, significant white space. Or anything, right? It doesn't address many other questions. But maybe it's a starting point. Depends on whether we agree on the starting point. Also. So uh, I think that's the best way to think. Uh, uh, large degree is, is cast as the, the utility, which is nice, but then don't forget about the stuff that uh, Andrew did, alluded yesterday, manipulating code. Yeah, yeah. 
I so mean, this is, I, I mean, for this works, there is a reason we like brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the reasons is it gets us in a state where we, our code is mostly syntactically correct. Yeah. So I'm just going to go to I think so. I think Vlad's comment is similar to, to Chris's. Yeah, that it's, it's, it's about having the structure explicit, but also reduction. when you're thinking about readability, don't forget about manipulating your expressions as well. I mean, we all know how, how great S expressions are for that. Well, um, earlier you mentioned that maybe improving performance wouldn't necessarily draw more people to buy it. And so I guess my only question would be might that be a similar issue here? Mm -hmm. and then, Maybe if we adopt that sort of syntax, and now we look like other languages. But it, you know, so I guess my concern is the removal of a, a perceived negative is sufficient. Yeah. There right. needs to be more about advocating some, some positive, and then people will forget maybe some of the negative. So let me answer. So let me try to repeat your question first. So I think Greg is saying, just like it could be a trap to think that you improve performance to attract people. It could be a traditional trap, traditional trap, traditional trap to think you trap to think you change. That might be the case. Partly my sense is that in fact changing the syntax has worked in a way that improving performance didn't. So to me, Java suddenly finally took a bunch of list stuff and it worked uh, for everyone in significant part because it looked like C. So I think maybe, maybe there's a lot of readings possible. I think maybe history tells us that this can be an, an effective solution. I think it, another half of your point, though, is to not lose what is special about that. So it's still um, a little bit. And it's still language-oriented programming. There's no way we're going away from that. In fact, we're, to, we're sort of doubling down and saying, look, this wasn't language-oriented programming just because it's parentheses. Right? Language-oriented programming is a bigger thing. And this past experiment, there are various things that have been looking at changing the, the sort of things closer to the front. But Honu, uh, which very few of you have heard of, and that's fair, is part of a research project. Um, has looked at this question of how to get racket style macros without the parentheses. And there's a very specific technology called enforestation that you know makes it feel like we actually made some progress on this problem. So I think we will be able to preserve that. And did I cover what you meant to say, Greg, for everyone yeah, else? Okay. Okay. Just to say one more thing about that. That's the technology that's used in, for example, the Rust macro system, um, roughly. Uh, and the, if anyone's heard of SweetJS, which is a JavaScript macro system, so. Uh, right, so we, we made some headway sort of getting that idea that research out, um, but we can, we can go on. So yeah, I have a little bit of a research agenda here as well, uh, behind my opinion of which way we should go. I think Jay's next. Um, these like three syntactic principles that you have up here, um, I think this is a great way to think about it. For me, um, the big questions are, do we support macros like if and where? So let me just comment briefly on what I mean by that. So like where in Haskell, if you think of where is not being really built into the language, it's a macro where the fact that you're using it comes in the middle of an expression. Yes, and absolutely. Next, um, with if, the thing that's weird about if is that if is different when there's an else versus not. And I know that the way that Honu does this is that during the macro transformation process, essentially the tail of all expressions are is available. Um, and um, so do you feel like the Honu it, is what you're saying? We want to do what Honu did, but like really commit to it? Because I personally feel like when I was debugging Honu macros, um, it's very complicated. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I tried to do with Remix is try to make a, a rule that's like the parentheses rule. So for instance, you always go to the next semicolon, yeah. and that's where the macro is, no matter what. And so anyways, uh, I'm not saying that you have to decide right now what we're gonna do, but I want to know what you think about. You know, can, can you help other people that don't have as much yeah. of brains as you and I about these questions? Because I think maybe they think it's impossible to do if and else and where. Right, exactly. So this is why I put Honor and Remix both on here, right, because both of them have some ideas about how to go about this, and we need to look at those. Um, and like I said, this is not a some small group of people go off like we did with Racket CS and build it, and then we take, bring it back and then see how it works, right? This is going to be much more of a, a problem for groups of people looking at different ideas. Uh, we're going to need a bureaucracy, uh, uh, not, yeah, or, yeah, a 
hierarchy of some sort, working, group. uh, working groups, uh, design groups, and so on. Right? And that's what we will end up talking about the most in the, in the near future. But because, exactly because of these kinds of technical questions um, and sort of synthesizing experiences. So I've lost track because there are lots of hands, but John is going to follow up. So I would like to add, add two separate things. First of all, I'd like to build on uh, and, and strongly reinforce Jay's point. I, I think it almost maybe goes without saying. Um, this is a uh, trion called this a bicameral system, the notion that you have uh, two separate transformations involved in parsing. One that, that uh, there's a structure common to all forms of language, and it was parentheses, and it doesn't have to be parentheses. Uh, but that applies to everything, including uh, the macros, yes. um, makes a huge difference. Uh, as a negative example, I'd like to cite, and I'll try to be careful about this, the state that the Rust macros were in when I worked on them in 2012, which I think was terrible, largely because uh, there didn't exist that clear, like, you know what, we're all going to apply by these rules at this layer type of system. So I, I really hope that that's a sine qua non for the uh, redesign. Right. So for the people on the live stream, and please understand that I never get it as eloquently as other people have put it, but John is saying it's important to keep read versus expand. It's important to keep a notion of read, some uh, semi-structured input format that lets us hang the macro system on, uh, on top of. Um, and that goes to Jay's comment as well. The thing about S expressions as the read result is that it provides a certain amount of grouping. There could be other kinds of grouping. And Honu was yet another way of looking at a kind of thing we, we need to. Does that capture what you were saying? It does, it does. And then also, the other thing I wanted to say really briefly about uh, Greg's comment about the value of changing syntax uh, is that I've become convinced recently by various people who say that programming languages people's attempt to detach syntax from semantics largely fails, at least in the minds of undergraduate students, and that they often leave remembering like, oh yeah, the one with the parentheses was like this, and the other one was like this. But maybe I can put this in a positive sense. I think that when, if we do some kind of syntactic redesign, I, we probably, I think, should think about branding and to some degree uh, try to create a syntax which maybe not in a stupid or ugly way actually creates an identity for the language where people say things like, oh yeah, I remember that language. It kind of looked like this. So that rather than trying to just be like other languages, uh, Racket 2 has a distinct Okay, yeah, and, and that's the kind of thing that a design group takes up. So just John's point was, maybe you don't pick Python syntax because everybody likes Python, pick something that is distinct and that people will say, oh, that's racket. Replace parens with square brackets. Racket <laughs> 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 square. Let's, so let's do this only for about five more minutes. So I think it's become clear. Like, let's not cut it off now, but I think you see how this is going to be a long discussion, right? How we will organ need to organize ourselves to have discussions and so on. So um, uh, we'll do these two starting here and then going. We'll start here with you, Jim. With me. Yeah. All right. If Racket was popular enough, would we be considering this? If Racket was already popular enough, that would be an indication to me. Enough would mean that the culture does accommodate parentheses and we don't need to do that. So, no, I would not be doing this. I would not be suggesting this. Uh, changing, moving away from parentheses if uh, enough people had already adopted it. But we, we've seen this a few times over and over again to believe that we really will have to change to reach some segment of the population and that that would be a sizable segment. And there are uh, more hands popped up, I know. We could keep going, but let's get to this one. So, this is maybe a comment. One thing I like about the phrase that I'm using, because it's unique, it's actually is I can go back to the papers. And I'm like, oh, change the defaults to fines, change these things, and that code runs. And you can't do anything else. It's, uh, it's, it's a for readability, and one of the things that attracts me is I want my code to work in a hundred years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the comments, if I you can check whether I repeat it. Uh, parentheses are kind of like Greek, you know, it still works. We can still read the old papers um, even better, more maybe closer to Latin, I don't know, something even closer to what we speak in the, in the modern world. Uh, the Greeks speak Greek in the modern world. But, uh, <laughs> in, in America, you know. Uh, 
it's all about social context. So, yeah, we're, we're not giving up the idea of parentheses very lightly. There's always hash rate where 5 rs <laughs> There is, yeah. That's a good point. I think that's a, in the set of trade offs we'll have to consider. All right, how, how long do we have left? We've got two and a half minutes. So, I think uh, we'll have this before you, but I'll come back. Uh, what's the timeline? Timeline. I have no time. We, we start to, we start figuring out how to organize ourselves soon. Um, I, the sense I get from this room is that this is worth exploring, but this, that's from this room. We'll, we'll see from the broader community. I have a meta question, so I don't know if that gives me an extension over the cutoff. All right, <laughs> looking for a loophole. Well, the, so I've got now rapid production. Yeah, and also I have a whole different set of questions that didn't come before. And even before this, I was going to ask: Is there a policy for like I'm running 7.3 now, and the policy of end of life meaning or support or patching old versions, that was my first yeah. question. And then this just expanded it to, we're going to go either do this or not. So, yeah. if, and I'm not going to debate for that. That's right. what we can't do forever. What would it look like if we did? If we didn't, I have a better idea of what things would look like. If we did, then that expands the end of life support question of, um, I'm not really asking for time frame, but but um, it's, it's related, right? Well, so first let's clear that hash lang racket programs are going to keep working, right? I have too many of them myself that I never <laughs> have to get something. But that's the point of hash lang, that we get to experiment in this way without losing our, our history and our, our code base, right? There are sometimes it's not as clean as, oh, this module's in this syntax and this module's in the other syntax, right? We had to do a break with mutable pairs long ago. Um, so certainly I think one of our goals uh, maybe not stated yet, but should be continue supporting racket programs as they are. Continue providing good support uh, for the parentheses as they are. Um, for the more specific question about 7.3, you know, something's going to change in 7.4. Um, do we do, can we go back and patch things? We have done that on a case-by-case -case basis in the past. Sometimes we found it valuable when there was a big enough change to go back and maintain an old one for a point one revision or something. We haven't found that necessary often but it's just sort of driven by feedback in the community uh, when that needs to be done. If there's a serious <laughs> bug that's in all Exactly, that exactly. So there was a version 200 to 300, there was a big change, and that's why there's a 200p1, right? Because we weren't yet using the standard version system, but that was a patch that we had to do in that case. That's kind of a very old example, but we're certainly still up here. All right, Ryan, you may get the last word here. I think I can make this quick. There's the old joke that people new to Lisp get hung up on the parens, and the next frame of the cartoon is the Lispers' view that they don't even see the parens. Well, what if we made it so you just didn't see the parens? <laughs> <laughs> what, if it, what if it's a matter of tooling, not syntax? Well, my immediate reaction is that it doesn't solve the infix thing, but that's just sort of a Except that we have yeah. infix notation. Yeah, I, so yeah, we can make it so you don't see the dots. Like I know. We could make it so that And then I'm gonna ask as long as you make it so that function calls have function name open brain and so on. But that's why people will want this to be negotiable. And so that's why it's gonna be a longer conversation. Feel free to make your color scheme have white friends. Yes. Invisible friends and significant white lights are the same color. Invisible friends and significant lights. All right, I know many of you still have burning burning opinions to <laughs> express, and please do express them to your, your fellow record kind of Are we gonna take a break now for a while? Here, you got nothing more? I got nothing more. Okay, um, just as a little aside, I think this last thing, I think that we should take a page from uh, what we heard Aaron talk about yesterday and make like a repository on GitHub for RFCs and collect ideas, and I'll take charge of making something so if you want to have conversations today and start thinking about what you want to put on there, I think that's a good way to go forward and collect all, like, all ideas. Yeah, just in case anyone couldn't hear today, what I, I meant to say Aaron's talk yesterday, the keynote, was obviously timely. Um, and it's not like a coincidence that his talk happens to be applicable to what I want to say today. Right? It's not something I set up, but it's also not a coincidence. All right. All right, let's take a break then. Okay, so we'll take a break for about 25 minutes. I'm <laughs> 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 
And uh, <laughs> you're, you're only allowed to shoot three bullets at a time, kind of like in Mega Man. Um, and notice that it's running at uh, like 15 frames per second. Okay, sometimes it gets up to like 20. Okay, so that's where we're going to start. We're going to start in that version. And then we're going to end up in this version. Hold on. We got to go really fast here. Ah. I died. <laughs> I could move this screen. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me try to do it faster. Okay. Okay, so now this one's running at 140 frames per second. Um, and so this is the almost exactly the same uh, logic code. This is showing you that the entire difference in performance is all about the drawing library. Okay, so like it literally is exactly the same uh, logic. So anyway, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make the, the first version and then convert it to the fast version. Sound good? Okay. So there's uh, boring parts of it. Uh, well, I consider them boring, which is just like drawing the pictures. I'm gonna go relatively fast showing the pictures. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this code available somewhere? Yep, it's linked on the Hackathon page. So yeah, don't try to write it in. You, can, you know, copy and paste. I'm starting in the world The racket wiki hackathon. Yep, the racket wiki hackathon page uh, has it. It's in my repository, so github.com slash je apostrophe, the word apostrophe, slash game jam, the space, dash 2019. So the background is just going to be an empty scene that's midnight blue, very beautiful. My player, that guy at the bottom, uh, he's going to have um, midnight blue thrusters, um, which are half the size of an actor. What an act, what's an actor, by the way? Actor is half the size of the border. So this is like a scalable image. Um, the cockpit, the little ellipse in the middle, going to be a little ellipse that's you know, this particular size. My, uh, my son, by the way, drew all these pictures. Um, so he spent, uh, when I first made it, it was a circle. And he said, Dad, you can't make it a circle. <laughs> so he drew these pictures. So the cockpit is a little ellipse. The ship is a little triangle. And basically what we do is we take the triangle, the ship, put the cockpit on top of that, so that's a little ellipse in the middle. And then we put on the left bottom one thruster and on the right bottom the other thruster. And so because they're the same color as the background, it basically makes it so that there's like a little gap in them. The bullets are little ellipses that uh, are on top of a triangle, so it makes it look like it's kind of, it, it makes it kind of look like it's like a, because the triangle is obscured by the ellipse, so it kind of looks like a rocket. The invaders are um, the gray ellipse on top of um, two, uh, like a green ellipse, like a little green circle inside of another ellipse, so that's why it looks like a little pod guy. Okay. And then the, their bullets are just the little ellipses on the other sheet. Okay, so uh, you don't have to like totally internalize what that looks like, but let me just top it up again so you can see. Okay. So down there you can see the players got those two triangles, which are the thrusters. Um, uh, he's got the bullets, which are like little triangles. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing the algebraic image stuff. In fact, I'm going to spend no time doing the algebraic image stuff. Um, but this is the sort of thing where it's really convenient to use Dr. Rackett because you can quickly experiment with lots of different pictures. Um, and to get something that you want. Okay, so the images are done. So now we want to actually do the logic of the game. So again, I'm going to go relatively fast doing the logic of the game because uh, you know you are amazing graphic programmers. So we'll kind of start at the bottom. So we're going to end up with a call to Big Bang. Um, uh, Big Bang, if you're not familiar, or maybe you want a way to think about it, essentially what you're doing with Big Bang is you are making a state machine. And the state machine, this value right here, is the initial state. And then what the Big Bang library does is it automatically calls transitions 
that correspond to time happening and that correspond to um, people pressing keys. So this right here uh, says that when, uh, when time has passed, and if we when one sixtieth of a second has passed, it's gonna call the move dash invaders and bullets function. I didn't of course show you what that is. So basically what you're doing is Big Bang has this kind of transition, time, or called tick, and then you're connecting what function does that. And this function, it's a function that takes a state and returns a new state. The on key function is going to take the state as well as the key that was pressed and then return a new state. And then finally, kind of like I always forget whether it's a melee or a more machine, you provide a function that takes a state and then produces the output for that state. In this case, the output is a picture, so it's draw screen. Okay, so let me show you draw screen first because that's going to be the easiest one. The so draw screen is going to look like this. Actually, you know what? I probably should probably show you the state first. So we can make sense of all these things. So my state is going to be the player, the player's bullets, the invaders, and the invader's bullets. So it's just a, a tuple of those four things. When we actually want to draw, what we're going to do is we're going to take the background. And then we're going to draw the player on top of that. So we're going to call the draw one function. Then we're going to draw all the player's bullets. Then we're going to draw all the invaders. Then we're going to draw all the invaders' bullets. Um, because we're drawing on top of the things that were there before, it's an important um, UI design to make sure that the things that can kill you are at the very top so that they're never obscured. So that's why we draw them in this order. Um, and then what we're going to do is we have this little hack where we're going to keep track of what time it was the last time we ran, what time it was now, and then figure out how many frames per second we're getting. Um, so that's, that's how we can get that little display in the corner. How about the frames per second? Um, draw sum just folds over draw one, and draw one just says what image do you want to draw, what position do you want that, pull off the x position, the x value, and the y value and then plop it into the scene. So um, we are using uh, the, the algebraic part of the library basically only to draw the individual sprites, the only, only the individual elements. And then what we're doing is we're just having a giant um, like list of what you're drawing and where exactly you're drawing it. So you can, of course, use the algebraic stuff to produce the entire image, but we're not doing that. Any questions? This is still the relatively boring stuff. So let's talk about the initial position. So my initial position is going to work in the following way. We're going to say that the initial state, the player, is going to be in a position that's in the middle of the screen and then basically just below the bottom border. So remember the border is a percentage. We're basically saying they're 95% down. There's initially no player bullets and initially no invader bullets. And the invaders, well, where are they? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to have a matrix of them. So we're going to have a particular number of rows, a particular number of columns, and then we're going to convert each column into an X value and each row into a Y value. Um, there's nothing especially clever about these, but I'll just comment on them briefly. So we're going to have five rows and nine columns. That's the same number. Actually, there's a little bit more than the original Space Invaders game. That's why I picked that number. Um, and the way that we convert columns into X values and rows into Ys is basically each column counts as one unit of the border. So remember, the border is 5% of the screen. So we're basically making it so that every row takes up 5% of the screen. And then we skip the first two rows. So basically it makes it so that the, the invaders are kind of centered a little bit. And we have a function to go back. So again, these are just little math functions. When you make your game, you know, you're going to have some other concept. And so this part is not really <coughs> Okay, so we've made the initial state, we've made the initial invaders. So we need to talk about what we do when we move things and what we do when we handle keys. So um, everything else has already been done, so this is where the action's gonna happen. 
I think personally, handle key is a little bit simpler, so let's do that one first. So, to handle a key, our state function, b, so, sorry, our state value is going to be called b, and then we're going to get a key event. And a key event is basically a string um, for whatever key on your keyboard was pressed. So, if the key is left, then we're going to call the move player function with minus three delta. And if it's the right function, we're going to do plus three delta. And if it's the space bar, then what we're going to do is we're going to look at how many bullets there are. If the number of bullets is less than three, then we're going to add one bullet. We're going to cons that out to a list of bullets where the X position is where the player is. And the Y position is just a little bit ahead of where the player is. So the idea there is that the bullet appears in front of the move player function the move player function just takes the dx and does pause and plus on the player with the dx value so i'm using this pause and plus function which takes a pause in and then two um, uh, differences and then adds things the only thing that might be uh, unknown to you about this is the struct copy form so struct copy is something that Racket has where you say, um, I want to take a structure that is of type ST, and the value is B, and I want everything to stay the same except for one field, or you can do any number of fields, but in this case, I do one field. And so you list the field name and then the new value for that field. So this is a very convenient way of updating the structure without modifying the pieces that we don't want to change and without having to actually like pull off all the individual values and like remember what they were and stuff, which would be really annoying, especially if we make the structure bigger. Yeah. Can, can uh, you say anything about the performance characteristics of the struct copy versus mutating an existing struct? It's slower. So struct, <laughs> so struct copy, like this code right here, is literally the same as ST, um, this code, ST, P bullets, B, ST, I bullets, and ST invaders B. So it literally just expands into that. So that means that it constructs a new object and pulls up the fields of the of the, of the base object. Um, if you mutated, it would be faster. But as you saw, that's not relevant, right? The part of our code that's slow is not the fact that we're copying all these objects. It's just the the drawing. So the, the only thing that we're going to change to go from 15 frames per second to 140 frames per second is only the drawing. We're going to do just as much creating of lists and mutating structures as we want. And like this code, by the way, does like makes no attempt to be um, once once we get to moving the the, the lists around, uh, we're going to create like many many copies of the list. We're making no attempt whatsoever to do it. Anymore. Okay, so that's our movement. So let's talk about, uh, sorry, that's our handling of the keys. So now let's do actually moving the invaders. So prepare for the onslaught of a bunch of code coming at you, which we'll walk through in a moment. All right, so here's our logic for moving the invaders. First, we're going to figure out where the player is. Okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to take all of the bullets and then that move bullet minus two by them. So what that's going to do is it's going to move them towards the top of the screen. Then what we're going to do is we're going to filter away the ones that are off the screen. So if something goes off the screen, then it's gone. Okay, notice that this is very not performant because we're creating two versions of the list. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go look at all the invaders, move them, and then get rid of them if they're off the screen. Very similar logic. Now, this is kind of complicated. We're only going to, at this point, we're not going to figure out which invaders that just moved just got hit by a bullet. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, we're going to take the moved bullets and the moved invaders, and we're going to return a list of the bullets that are left over, because bullets disappear when they hit something. If you don't do that, then the game is not fun, because bullets just go through one enemy <laughs> to the very next one. Okay, so it's actually, you know, the, the obvious way to program this makes it really not fun game. Okay? <laughs> So the code is messy because you want the game to be relatively fun. Okay, so now we get 
the version, the bullets that are left over. And then we also get the version, the invaders that are left over. So at this point then, we now move all of the bullets that are on the screen. And then we figure out what the new bullets are. So we're going to take the invaders that are left over and have them maybe shoot. So this maybe shoot function is either going to return an empty list when they don't shoot, or a list with one bullet in it when they do in fact shoot. We'll show these functions there. I'm just walking through the structure. Now we now need to make sure we need to figure out if any of the bullets that are around, they got hit. So we're going to do the same thing, which ones are hit. We're going to append the new bullets and the old bullets from the invaders and figure out which ones are left and which player bullets are left. So at that point, we're then going to take all of the targets together. These are the things that could hit the player. So we're going to append the leftover invaders and the leftover um, invader bullets. And then if, it's, if there's no targets left, then we won. If one of them hit the player, then we lost. And otherwise, we continue the game with all the leftover stuff. So, because this game inherently is concurrent, we had to make decisions about what order to do things in. So for instance, like um, invaders shoot bullets, bullets move, invader bullets move, and all of these things can hit the player. So because we're writing this in a purely functional way, we had to determine what order that we were gonna do all those things in and make a concrete decision about this. If you were to use like another library, like for instance, if you wrote this in Unity, the most likely thing to do is you're gonna make it so that every Invader is an entity, every bullet is an entity, an entity, and you're just going to have an update function. And those, those update functions are going to be called in some order. And then sometimes the invader bullet will move and then hit the player. And sometimes the invader bullet, you'll, you'll check to see if the player got hit af, uh, after, sorry, before they moved, and therefore the bullets will pass through you sometimes. So our game is like completely consistent because we're doing it in the exact same order all the time. It may not be the most intuitive order, but at least it's uh, documented. Okay, so any questions about the high-level structure? All right, we'll now look at the actual way that these functions are implemented. So let's start from the simplest ones. So it's really easy to figure out if something's on the screen. You just see whether or not you're between zero and the zero and the height. How do we move a bullet? Well, what we do there is we take the y value and the position of the bullet, and then we just multiply the y value by the delta. So notice that um, player bullets move at minus two and invader bullets move at plus one, so that means invaders shoot slower bullets than players. Pretty much all shooter games follow this rule. That you, when you shoot, it happens almost instantly. When other people shoot at you, you can see the bullet coming at you, so you can dodge. Um, how do we figure out to move an invader. This is probably the most complicated part because invaders have to move, go from left to right, and the ones in the top row move to the right, the ones in the second row move to the left, and when they get to the edge, they pop down. So this is a really annoying program to write. So the idea is that you figure out what position you're on, and this is rounding, and then if your row is even and you're not at the end, then you move over a little bit. But if you are at the end, then you pop down to the next row. And if you're odd, then if you got to the end, you pop down to the next row. Otherwise, you move a little bit in the other direction. So this makes it so that they have that you know, standard space invaders pattern. And so this is, this is the kind of function where uh, you should really write lots of test cases to make sure you're doing it properly. Uh, what I did is I just experimented and I watched it, and they did all sorts of incredibly bizarre things. And so I just figured out the next one. One of the great things about animations and games is that it's really, you know, you can generate uh, thousands of test cases per second by just playing it. <laughs> Do you have a question, Ryan? No, I just think it, so direction is just determined by running. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So similarly, another simple function is the maybe shooting function. So here, what we do is we maybe shoot over the the, um, the invaders, and basically flip a coin, and one percent of the time we shoot. Uh, I experimented with lots of other values, and one percent is relatively fun. Um, and the way that you do that is that you create a new position that's just ahead, that, that's as much ahead of you as your size is. So the bullets appear like in front of me after. Okay, what, what, I, what have I not done? Um, other functions that are simple are the hitting functions. Okay, so you figure out if something is hit, hits you by um, basically like figuring out, seeing if the distance between you 
those two points are within the actor size. Notice, by the way, that this is like a total hack because the actors are not actually displayed the same size. So this means that like, as a bullet comes towards you, if it gets within like a bounding box around you, that's always a circle, then you just get hit. So, you know, this is not, uh, improving this function would make the game more fair. But as, as it is, it's easy. And then when you want to figure out if one position is hit by another, then you just or map over that. What or map does is it calls this function on all of these values and um, returns the first one that's true. So it stops the first. Okay, um, the last function that's kind of awkward is that one that figures out when things are hit. So we'll show you that. Okay, so we're gonna use this helper function called remove question mark. And the remove question mark is like the racket function remove, which by the way, if you don't know what the racket function is, remove takes an object in the list and it returns a list without that object in it. What remove question mark does is it takes a function that figures out if the thing is, a, that, uh, re that removes the first thing that's not in the list, or where the function returns true on. So uh, that's right here. So if the first thing in the list returns true on the question, then we return the rest of the list. And we also return a flag that says whether or not anything actually got removed. Okay, so that's what the question mark part says. So if you're removing something and the list is empty, well then nothing got removed, so you return false. You actually did hit something and you return true. And then this is kind of awkward because when you when it doesn't match and you recur, you basically have to figure out whether it got removed in the rest of the list and just pass that back. This is the perfect example of uh, something where you want to use uh, this code right here, there, there's a really beautiful uh, monadic Haskell version of this. It's purely functional, uh, where you can write the flag once and you can use software or something like that. Okay, um, the find hit p bullets function, that's the one that takes our list of bullets and then our list of targets. And what it's going to do is it's going to make each bullet try to hit the targets. And any bullet that does, it throws that bullet away and it doesn't use it anymore. And then it returns which bullets are left over. So if you've finished, um, if there are no bullets, then obviously you didn't hit anything and there are no bullets left over. If there's one bullet though, well then you figure out whether or not that one bullet hit one of the targets. And remove question mark will tell you whether or not it, it hit something. So if it hit something, then that means that you're not going to include it in the bullets that come back, because that one got used up. Otherwise, you will include it. And then you have this recursive call where you ignore that bullet and look at all the remaining targets. And it's important that you look at the remaining targets, not all of the targets, because uh, you don't want multiple bullets to hit the same object. Okay, so at this point, the function is done, or the program done. I'm pretty sure I didn't forget to copy anything. Let's just double check. All right, so it's now actually running, and ooh, just in time, <laughs> and we can use it. And like I said, notice that we are at uh, you know 15 frames per second. Okay, so now what we want to do is I want to show you how to. I think of it. So I mean, maybe this is a little bit too uh, too my own horn a little bit, but I want to show you how to graduate from Big Bang. Okay, so Big Bang is a really great experimental environment. Um, but there's lots of things that are not flexible about it, and there are lots of things that are not performant about it. Um, and so what I've done is I've written two separate libraries um, that first add more <coughs> flexibility, and then once you add more flexibility, then you can convert to also using um, the higher performance link, which couldn't work without the more flexibility. So we're going to use a new library that is going to replace universe. We're not going to use universe anymore. <coughs> this new library is called Lux. Big Bang, the 2HTTP universe library, you are creating a universe, and the universe starts with the Big Bang. Okay. Lux, you are creating the word and the word creates with 
gets created with Fiat Lux, which you don't know, it's the first phrase in that God says in the Bible in Latin. Okay. Now we're going to use some. Um, now, in the beginning, there was just chaos, and then the word was created from the chaos. So one of the ways in which Lux is more flexible than Big Bang is it does not insist that the interactive program that you're making is a GUI program. It has a generic way of saying, you're going to create something inside of some other context. So there are GUI ones, there are text-based ones, um, there are ones that run purely um, in the background, there are ones that you're just making sounds and stuff like that. So there are many of these different things where you can run interactive computations, and so they're called chaoses. So we're going to get the GUI chaos. Now, because we're going to use 2 HTTP image, we want to be able to display values in our chaos. So we're going to get looks chaos GUI value, and we're going to use a convenient uh, key handling library. So we're just going to pull up a bunch of different things. Okay, so we made that one change. Let me, let me put most of our changes. We're going to put most of our changes in this region right here, because we're going to be changing a lot of stuff having to do with the state. Now, that GUI value thing, we're going to create a function called output image, which this make GUI value, which we got from Lux Chaos GUI value, we're going to use this function output image. It does some other stuff too, but we're going to use it in a really simple we just need this output image function. Essentially, every time we want to display an image, we're just going to call output image. Um, the next thing is, is that um, so in uh, actually, let me put the right one. Okay, I'll do this. Let's go change this function down here. Rather than calling Big Bang, instead we're going to call Fiat Lux. On the additional on the initial state, right? But now, when you call fiat box, you have to say in what chaos you're doing this. Right. So we're going to do call with chaos, and then we pass that up. Now, what chaos are we doing? Well, we're going to do it inside of a GUI chaos with the width and height that we specified. Okay, so notice that we now are no longer saying move invaders, handle key, draw screen. We're also not telling it how fast to update. All of that information in Big Bang is part of the call to Big Bang. However, in Lux, all of that information is going to be part of initial state. Initial state is essentially going to be like an object, and that object is going to have a method called draw yourself and a method called on key and a method called tick, and a method called how many frames per second are you right now? And all of those things will be able to be changed at any, at any moment. And in fact, um, the objects that get returned from these functions don't have to be the same kind of thing as initial state starts as being. So that means that like, you can be, the way I think about it, you can be like a menu object, and then when you click something, you can then return the game object. And then when you lose, you can return a new menu object and go back to the world. Okay. So how do we actually get that information inside of the initial state here? So we're over here at the definition of state. And the way that we do it is we're going to use the racket generics system. So we're going to say that there are some methods and state is an example of a word. It's a word, it's obviously a pun on worlds, which is what you can find in 2HTTP image, sorry, 2HTTP universe. And so we're going to define a few different methods. So the first method is a really simple one. It's going to determine what the label is of the, of the window that pops up. So the word label function takes the word and it takes how long it took to generate the image, the frame time. And then we're going to use the standard function, Lux standard image, that's going to say spacey invaders, and then it's going to show us the debugging information of the frame time and the frame time. 
So every time it runs, it calculates what the current frame time is in frames per second. And it actually isn't just doing that for debugging purposes. It actually needs to know what that is because it's going to, um, ticks are going to arrive at a consistent 60 frames per second, as opposed to in universe, where what it actually does is it generates one frame and then it waits, waits a 60th of a second. Which means that the individual frames will not occur at a consistent tick rate. They will occur, basically the tick time in the universe is a difference between them, not an absolute result. Is there a reason why Big Bang doesn't subtract the render time? Probably because it's not considered important to do that, and <laughs> the people who write it don't think that it matters. Okay, okay sure. <laughs> So next, how is our, um, how are we gonna out output things? So in Big Bang, you write an on draw function. But in Flux, you just make a generic word output function. And so this takes the, um, it takes the world, the word, and produces the output version of that. And this is specific to the kind of chaos that it's running. So in this case, we're going to draw the stream, which is the same function that we, well, it's, yeah. For now, it's going to be this, the same function from before, and then we're going to call output image on it. So draw screen returns a two HTTP image thing, and then output image converts that into the format that GUI requires. And then output image, we made, that's a function that we made right there. Yeah, it's, it's this function right here. And okay. the reason that make GUI Sorry, that the, the Lux Chaos, so let me just make a little note. From Lux Chaos GUI value. The reason that this function right here doesn't just expose output image is because this thing takes options that are interesting and relevant. And we want to cache that information so it's more efficient. Is there any, does that function encapsulate an mutable state or anything? Or is it yes. Just yes. Oh, okay. It encapsulates mutable state as part of efficiency. Because this output may be called multiple times without the mod without the without your word actually changing. Okay. So, you can't do so you can't do the you can't do two words at once concurrently, right? Because they're sharing that same state. No, 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 no. Error. You you could do multiple at, at once. Okay. Yeah. Um, Lux does lots of things that I'm not going to show you. Um, as an example of something, so. In Big Bang, if you have one Big Bang program, and then as a key event, you call Big Bang again, then you will get two windows. In Lux, if you have one Lux program, and on tick you call Lux, it will take over the outer window, pause the outer computation, run the inner word until it finishes, and then return the value to the handler that was called in the other place. And then give control of the chaos back to the outer word. So that basically means that you can actually, a, a way to think about that is in Big Bang, if you want to have a computation that takes like two steps, so for instance, like you choose, you play a menu, like you do a menu, and then once you select something, then you go off and play a game. In Big Bang, you either have to have two windows pop up, which is really annoying, or what you need to do is you need to make it so that it's actually one giant computation, and you have to make it so that your state object actually encodes the paused computation of the menu while the game is running and knows to hand it back. Whereas obviously that means that you have to manually encode continuations, and so Lux just like does the right thing in Racket by actually just capturing the continuation. So like Final Fantasy Battle. Exactly, so this would be, if you wanted to have like a game where you start the game, there's a menu, you select your file, then you go into your game and you're in the explore mode, and you get into a fight, and you're in the turn-based battle, and then you, you know, pause, and you get another menu. So you would write each one of those as its own word, and then you could just call Fiat Lux inside of other computations, and it would just automatically take over the, the screen. So what did you say pops back? When, so uh, notice that when we were playing the Big Bang game and I got hit, the game stopped. So when, when your computation stops, a value gets returned to the caller of Fiat Lux. So you could pop back modified world state. Exactly. So you can pop back like how much experience you got or the updated player stats or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing that we need to do um, is we'll handle events. 
Uh, let me just make, mention one more thing about the outputs. Like I said, the outputs are specific to the kind of chaos that you're running in. So if you're running in the text environment, then you're not going to return a, a picture. You're going to return a you're going to return something that draws text on the screen. I have a library that's very very similar to uh, to HTTP image uh, for making ASCII art. It's um, yeah, it's called Art Rac Racket ASCII art, um, and so uh, it's very it's very fun. Uh, I have another one that uh, makes it so that the output of your game is a two-dimensional soundscape, and it, and it displays that by creating a stereo sound thing. So you can like, you know, you can make it so that like this. So the the, the example, the main example that I have is like a pong game. So when you hit the left paddle, there's a bump that's on the left side, <laughs> on the left headphone, and when you hit the right one, there's a bump on the right headphone, and as the as the as the as the ball goes from one side of the screen to the other, the whoosh goes from one side to the other in your ears because it modulates the sound as it goes through. So, anyways, that's just an example of the kind of output. And the, how how the how the thing works is that you can combine chaoses together. So you can say that so there's a pair of chaos where it basically it's kind of like a it's kind of like a, a puncture in Haskell. I have a meta question. Are we moving in the repo? Are we moving from world bracket to lux bracket? No, yeah, we're moving from world to lux. I just pasted the whole damn thing in because I'm lazy and it feels massive. Um, yes, lux is going to be okay. lux is going to be a little bit slower. Okay. So our way that we get input, we get input, we get input, we get input. Very similar to on key, where we have our current state. And then the event that came in. However, we have to do a little bit more, which is that we we get exposed like the window closing. So if the event is closed, then we're going to stop and say "board result you quit." And if there's a key event, then we're going to use that little helper um, uh, thing uh, the, that we got from Lux Chaos GUI key to store the key state. We're actually going to add a field to our state. Called the key state. And what we're going to do is so, in like normal games, if you like press the left button and you press it faster than the tick rate of the game, you shouldn't be allowed to move multiple times. But that's the way the Big Bang works. Because every time you press a key, then that key updates the world, as opposed to remembering that the key was pressed so that the next time you tick, you'll now be able to cause the state to update. You can of course do you can you can encode that way of things working with Big Bang by making it so that when you press on key, you store in your state that the key happened, and then the on tick actually looks at that. Uh, but that's such a common pattern that that's actually like that's what this library Lux Chaos GUI key does. And this is actually going to be relevant for our program because it's actually going to run fast. Um, so if you didn't do this and you did it the old way. Then, because it would be running so fast, you would be able to like zip across the screen, and it wouldn't be the same thing. Okay. Um, this key state, by the way, is going to start off. Um, as just a main key state. All right, there's one last thing that I want to show, which is that notice right here we say we return word result. So our word result function is actually a function that we're going to make. And so there's a function called word that creates a new anonymous word. Most words are structures that implement generics. But word returns a word with all of the defaults except for a few things different. So this word, its return value is the value that you put in, and its tick function just returns false. And whenever a tick returns false or an on key returns false, then the computation stops. And so notice that a word event then, it can return a kind of word that's different than the one that it started at. This is what I mean by um, it's more flexible. Because we take in the generic functions and put them inside of the object, that means that every tick, it can actually be a different function that's running by returning different kinds of objects. OK. So the only thing left to show is the actual tick function. And the tick function, what it's going to do is it's going to call handle key and then move. And this handle key is very similar to our old handle key.
So this is our old handle key. In our new one, what we're going to do is we don't get the KE argument anymore. We just get one thing. So then what we need to do is we need to pull the key state out of the world. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to check and see whether or not the key state says that left was pressed or the key state says that right was pressed or the key state says that space was pressed. And so rather than having the actual KE object, we now have this opaque set of key state stuff. Yeah. Um, is it accurate to say that the um, pressing key and holding down key are represented the same way here with a, like a repeat rate of some kind? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that, is there a way you would like to determine, like, is this being held down versus is this being yeah. Yep, so um, the set thing, basically what it does is it looks, basically there's separate um, press and release things that it records inside of the key state. So you can make it so that when you press, you enter, um, you, you basically say, is this pressed? What was this press just now? And then you can like cause it to be released and stuff like that. To force the basically by you making it released, you force the player to press the button again. Yeah. And I am pretty sure that we got everything. Why does key state set have scary names? <laughs> Why does it have scary names? Because um, it modifies the um, basically once you've observed. That a key has been pressed, it's going to reset everything. Okay. So if you call key state set, then the key is left again if it's false. Correct. Yep. And that's that's the behavior that um, that Phil was asking about. Okay. So there's just a few tiny little changes that we need to do. Um, so the first one is actually that the bottom of our move invaders function. The bottom of our tick function, it uses stop with, which is a big bang thing that we've replaced with the word result. And then also this one right here, I actually didn't make that a struct copy. And because I didn't make that a struct copy, uh, it doesn't pick up on the fact that there's this new key state thing. So I should have used a struct copy all along. So that's an example of why struct copy is useful. When you add fields, you don't have to update all of the calls with the constructors. And then the last thing is the trying. The drawing, we no longer are going to need that frames per second thing. So we're just going to return the state. Because Lux is going to take care of showing us what the frames per second is. So I'm pretty sure that everything is good now. Where's the frames per second? It's in the window. It's in the title of the window. Okay. So now it used to be that we went at about uh, 20 frames per second, and now we're hitting like pretty much exactly 14 frames per second, and we never really changed. So this modification actually made our code slower. Um, and you can kind of think of why is it slower? Well, it's slower because we're actually allocating a few more kinds of objects, um, and we could we could spend time doing less allocation to make this faster, but it turns out that it's not going to matter. Because the, thing, the main thing that's slow about this is actually just doing the drawing. Um, so the real reason that it's slower is, is actually we, um, we're doing, what was the word that I say this? Like we're drawing more times. And so we're, we're like, sorry, we're trying to draw more times. And since we're trying to draw more times, we end up putting more like memory pressure on the machine. I think that's what the reason why is. But it doesn't really matter because we're going to make some changes. Okay, so now we're going to switch to the mode lambda version. So mode lambda is a um, is a replacement, in some sense, for uh, basically a replacement for uh, this function lux chaos gui value. Because basically, what that thing does is it takes a two HTTP image object and actually draws it onto a canvas. And so a 2 HTTP image is an algebraic description of a bunch of shapes and how to embed them inside one another and how to draw something. Mode Lambda is going to replace that with a different way of thinking about images. And the, sorry, a different way of thinking about scenes. So um, notice that um, when we draw, we basically say, 
here's what my background looks like. Draw this object player in this spot, then draw this object p bullet in these spots, and so on. When we actually draw the screen, we really just have a list of sprites and their positions, and then we just take all of those and we draw them. Mode Lambda provides exactly that abstraction. It says, here's a list of sprites, and here's where their positions are, and go draw those. Now, in this program, it doesn't make a difference, but we are giving up something when we use Mode Lambda. The thing that we're giving up is that we couldn't do something like take the scene, rotate it, shrink it down, and then put it next to another copy of itself that we tinted orange, and then have that happen three times. Right? So you can't actually talk about the entire screen, exclamation, uh, asterisk, um, inside of Mode Lambda. Now, for many games, you actually want this abstraction. So Mode Lambda is exactly what you want. And, uh, but maybe this would be, like, I think that this would probably be a bad abstraction for, like, Fracture, which we saw yesterday, which was Andrew's thing. Um, it's doing, it's not just taking objects and just laying them out of different positions. It actually is using that algebraic thing for the entire screen. So it would be much more difficult to convert something like that to Mode Lambda. Okay, so <clears throat> the way that we're going to do this, so let's go up to the top. So the first thing is uh, we're going to need to talk about colors. So we're going to get the color database from Racket. And then we're going to get the Mode Lambda libraries and remove the new value. Okay. The next thing about uh, Mode Lambda is that first of all, Mode Lambda exposes to you that it's doing OpenGL rendering. There's a software renderer and a GL renderer, and you have to decide which one you want to use. The software renderer is extremely slow. It's just for uh, making test cases. The other thing is that Mode Lambda has a compilation model. So before your game ever starts, you decide what pictures you're ever going to show. And you compile those into a sprite atlas. Let me show a picture of the sprite atlas. So this is the sprite atlas that we're going to generate. So what's going to happen is that that picture is going to be uploaded to the graphics card, and then all images will be saying, just show a piece of that image over and over again. So from the graphics card, there's only one image that you're showing, it's that one. And then it just shows pieces of that image. That's why it's fast. Doing that to the blood test. As opposed to how um, 2 HTTP image works, 2 HTTP image basically says, all right, it's time to draw something. OK, put my cursor here and go like this, and then draw an ellipsis. And pop in like pixels as we're going around, it's very it's much slower. Whereas we're just going to copy a block of memory into a converse block. You don't have to think about any of those things, by the way, but that's how it's going to work. OK, so because of that, we need to construct this database of sprites. So what you do is you make a sprite database, and then I'm going to find a little helper function called define sprite. Sprites are identified by symbols, so we're going to add the sprite to the database, and then we're going to use the name for it to be that symbol. So basically, um, we're, going to, we're not going to have the background anymore. We're going to get the background another way, but we're going to change this defined player to defined sprite. That's all we need to do. It used to be that player was an algebraic object that we would plop in over and over again. Now what we're doing is we're adding it to the database. Oops, sorry. We're adding it to the database and we're giving it the name player. And then in our, the other parts of our code, we're going to refer to the name player. So we're going to do that to player. We're going to do that to the bullets. We're going to do that to the invader. And we're going to do that to the invader bullets. Once we've made all of the sprites, well, then what we're going to do is we're going to compile the database. So we're going to take the database and compile it. That comp compilation process is going to actually produce that image that I showed and a bunch of other helpful information. For debugging purposes, I saved that out to the disk, which is how I can show you the picture. This saving process has a loading process as well, so you can actually make it so that your code saves something and then loads it, and that's part of your build process. Because potentially, it's much more expensive to draw your pictures than it is to like load them and display them, 
which is pretty much the case for like all 3D things where you want to compute like a shadow map, and get like the normals and everything like that. Okay. <clears throat> the next thing that we need to do is uh, initialize uh, mode lambda. So the way that we initialize mode lambda is like before we had this output image function, we're going to delete that output image function and we're going to get a mode lambda draw function. So the mode lambda draw, we're going to say, here's the database that you're going to use, here's your width and your height, and here's how many layers you have. So I told you that it can't deal with things about the entire screen, but that's actually a lie, it can. So in mode lambda, you have, you draw on a particular number of layers, and then those layers, you can individually like rotate them, scale them, and you can do a basic 3D effect where you basically like imagine a flat thing. You can like tilt the screen backwards or tilt the screen forward. That's called uh, mode seven in the Super Nintendo. Um, so <laughs> it can do the exact same things that the Super Nintendo did. Like and it's, it's, it, it uses the exact same algorithm that it does. So for instance, if you remember Mario Kart, the way that Mario Kart works is it draws your picture in the middle of the screen and then there's a mode, mode seven layer, which is the map. And that's just a little tiny picture that's actually the uh, 2D version of the map. And then what it does is it blows that up and rotates it and moves you around. So basically, when you're when you're driving in Mario Kart, you're not actually the, the character is not moving; the background is moving around. And that's what this allows you to do. And it can create that 3D effect where it makes it tilt the image and makes you feel like you're driving on top of something. Okay. <clears throat> then we need to um, get the background color, which is a little bit annoying. So we're going to call find color on the database, get the red, green, and blue, okay? And then now what we're gonna do is we're gonna change our output. So our output function used to call output image. Now we're gonna change it, so it's gonna call our mode lambda draw. We say here's the current configuration of all the layers. This list is called the static list, and this is the dynamic list, and then here are the background colors. Mode lambda has a concept of there being static elements of your game and dynamic elements of your game, and it optimizes the static ones. So for instance, like suppose that you are making, um, I don't know, like Pac-Man, the level itself is static, it never changes, and the characters and the dots, those are dynamic. And so it has a way of making it so that the, if the static part stays the same, then it's much more optimized. It turns out that it's extremely hard to write games, like this can handle millions of objects um, at hundreds of frames per second. So like, it turns out that the only reason that this is valuable, this, um, that that part is valuable, is for bracket allocation purposes. It's not actually relevant to the graphics card. Which part is doing the static? This empty thing is static. We don't have any static elements in that game. Can you uh, render static bits? Dynamically rendered into a static bit that you'll then use for like parallax. That's what we did with the sprite database. So the sprite database is our pre rendered set of stuff. And parallax is actually an example of something that you would do with the layer rotation stuff. Okay. Yeah. I'm a little curious about how aggressive compile sprite DB is about packing your sprites into the smallest possible image. Um, it uses dynamic programming um, to do it well. Uses an industry standard optimization algorithm. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So what else do we need to change? Um, there's just a few other little annoying things that we need to change because um, mode lambda insists on things like really being um, uh, yeah, like it insists that everything everywhere is actually a um, uh, a flow number, not a natural or a real. So there's a bunch of places in our program um, where we use numbers like 2 rather than 2.0. So I have to make a bunch of changes for that. But I'll only show the one meaningful change, which is that when we do the drawing, draw screen. when we do the drawing, we don't care about the background anymore. So the background is just going to be an empty list. And then drawing one is just going to cons the scene, sorry, this object, which is a sprite, onto the scene. Is that right? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, one more thing. Um, we actually, it's not the image, we need to look up the index of that image in the sprite database. So the sprite database that we've compiled has a map from the names that we gave things like tick invader to a number. And so we need to look up what that number is. If we wanted to, we could have actually made it so that we like pre-computed this, you know what I mean? But we only have like four sprites, so it's gonna be, it's not gonna be a performance problem to, to check every single time. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. We got the same thing. Okay. So um, now we run our program and it's the 140 frames per second version. Um, if we look at the diffs between them, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. I didn't hear what you said. The macro. Yeah, the macro does that. So, so if we look at the commits, so here is the change from using um, from using. Oh, it, oh that's annoying. It didn't. It doesn't show the diff. Split. You do by split. No, it's no, it's, it's it's totally the They're just ads, right? Yeah, it just it didn't it didn't track that I modified them. Did this one do it? Okay, so all right. So let's look at it. Okay. Okay, so if we look at the world version versus the Lux version, um, then we modified the requires, we added, we basically moved the information from the Big Bang call up to here, we added the key state, we modified the key handler a little bit, and um, we forgot we had to do that struct copy. <laughs> Now, when we go from the Lux version to the Node Lambda version, we have to modify the requires. I had to make it so that that half became 0.5. I had to make the sprite database and change the define into define sprite. That's actually a very problem. Here's a place where I had to change a bunch of you know, ones or a bunch of twos into 2.0. I had to compile the sprite database right here. I had to delete output image. I had to call and I'll draw rather than output image. Then I had to change a 2 to a 0.5, change a 1 to a 1.5, 1.0, 1 to 1.0, 0 to 0 0. 1 to 1 0, 0, to 0, 0. Uh, Looks like I hadn't I accidentally had an extra space. And then I had to change the place image to cons. And then I had, oh yeah, I had to do one last thing, which I had to tell. The mode that GUI will start in with the GUI mode. GUI mode is a symbol that comes from um, mode lambda. And that basically just tells it what version of OpenGL to use. Okay, so relatively minor changes. And recall that we have a much more faster version. Ooh, I made a mistake. Weird. What does that change? Ah. Oh, I know what the reason is. <laughs> Code it off screen. <laughs> Okay, so now we have the fast version. Um, while I'm playing the game, let me tell you what the problem is. Um, <laughs> so Mode Lambda was trying to figure out how big the screen was, but because I started the program on the display, uh, it was looking at the position that it would end up on on this screen, but using the screen dimensions of the other screen, and so it ended up being a negative number when it computed the top left hand corner. <laughs> I've actually never experienced that problem before, and just now, like 
you know, I like saw into the matrix and understood what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I put it into the other screen to start it. And it was fun. <laughs> okay, so anyways, um, so yeah, that's the first thing. Uh, the I feel like Big Bang is really fun for making little experimental things, but if you want to make something fast, you want something more. And so that's what Mode Lambda is for. And if you want to make something more complicated, meaning that has complicated control, control structure, Lux is really good for that, because it allows you to have different kinds of objects um, that are all their own um, states that control you know, how things are being drawn and whatnot. So you don't have to use these things if you work on a game today, and you don't have to work on a game today if you want to, don't want to. But I hope that we will spend the rest of the day packing together, and if you have any questions about, you know, macros to people that do macros and whatnot, you know, just let me know. I want to mention one last little tiny thing, which is that I made a repository uh, for Racket 2 RFCs um, that I uh, shamelessly copied the template from the Rust thing. Um, <laughs> And then what I did is I made a bunch of issues for things that I think people should write RFCs about. Um, maybe I will write RFCs about some of these things. So if you are just like passionately dying to uh, talk and you know uh, fight about Racket 2 stuff, uh, maybe we can have a Racket 2 corner. With that, do you want to say something first? No, oh, well, that's convenient. I just sent a proposal to the mailing list, so I can uh, copy it over the issues. But anyway, I was going to I was just going to give an unsolicited endorsement of Jay's stuff. Uh, I've used a whole lot of Jay's game dev libraries, and they're all really fun to use. But what's really exciting is the way that you can swap out the chaos stuff. I wrote an implementation of Tetris in just one evening once, and then I thought the next morning I woke up and I said, I wonder how long it would take for me to make a terminal version of it that ran as well using the same program. And by switching off the chaos and just a very few small number of things, I was able to have both things work in the same program with the same logic controlling both a, a, a cursor based version and also the, uh, uh, the and work is like the most fun library of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, let me just show you real fast like what the terminal ones look like. Um, so, okay, so here's a little terminal program that like searches through all of my bookmarks and stuff. So I'm going to start my uh, game database program. Oh, oh, I clicked the wrong one. Uh, oops. Okay, so let's go that. I'll look another one, sorry. I wasn't paying attention to where my cursor was. Okay, so now I'll start my game database. And so my game database crashed, of course. Of course it crashed. <laughs> Try one more time with something else. And we won't do my game database, we'll do my scripture memorizing program. Okay, my scripture memorizing program, it uh, shows me a scripture and it like closes the stuff that I don't want to do. And so this little program, like I can like switch between the different things I need to write down. So I'm going to this, I say unto you, um, here that is. And? No, no, it's not Okay, uh, sir. And now my. <laughs> <laughs> After you have gotten to the straight, narrow, have asked, all is done. Hold, I say unto you, nay. That's what it is, nay. Okay. So then when you're done, I'm going to skip over the rest. Then you hit enter, and then it tells you what you did right and what you did wrong, right? So it helps you do like bolding, inversing, colors, layout, it can lay out tables, lots of stuff like that. Anyways. It's really fun to make little terminal programs. So like that little program right there, that's 50 lines. Um, so, yeah. so anyways, so I'm pretty sure that uh, food will be here really soon. If it's not here really soon, we'll just get back. So have a great pack fun day. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Um, it's really great to see all of you today. You should know that compared to past years, you are 50% bigger, whether measured by numbers or by carryover from the previous day. Unfortunately, I ordered food for a typical event. So, more food is coming. You will find some food is here. Uh, some pizzas are coming to supplement that, including half, half of them being veggie pizza. 
So for those of you who have been here all week, you can waste the pizza and do like a full cycle back to the same pizza you got on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I have a better question. 